Buenas tardes, everyone. Good afternoon. How are you doing? Good. Holding up. <laughs> it's wonderful to be back home in Miami and wonderful to be home, uh, maybe in Dade College in another way. I'm not sure if it's uh, really widely known that when I first started writing, the little engineer that I could, I guess, um, who wanted to start a uh, was curious about poetry. Uh, actually, my first creative writing courses were right here in Miami Dade, so it's home in, in many places in one. So thank you. Um, I'd like to share with you just one excerpt and a few photos. The engineer can't go away from me. Um, I have to do PowerPoint somehow. Um, <laughs> there's no charts and graphs, don't worry. But um, begin by saying just uh, something that sort of guided my writing uh, is that uh, I think it was a uh, I think it was a poet, I can't remember exactly who I tried to research this, but that said that every writer, every poet in some way is writing one story or one poem all their life. And what that means figuratively, of course, is that, that, that we all have a unique sort of central obsession and that our whole body of work, that every poem we attempt or every story we attempt is in some way uh, a, a, an attempt to dimension some aspect of that obsession to ask questions about that, that obsession, to answer them and ask new ones and all the rest. And for me, that obsession comes down to one word, home, and all that that big word means in terms of family, community, place, culture, cultural identity, national loyalties, all the rest. And it's no wonder, in a sense, I had, uh, it was something that's probably obsessed me even before birth. Um, as I like to say, it was made in Cuba, assembled in Spain, and imported to the United States which my mother left seven months pregnant from Cuba to Madrid where I was born and 45 days later we emigrated to the United States. So by the time I was 45 days old I belonged to three countries. I had lived in two world-class cities. Uh, this is somewhat of a birth certificate and then they threw in there um, the Eiffel Tower and the Swiss Alps just to screw with me even further. <laughs> and that, that newborn photo that you see there was my green cart photo which was my very first ID in the United States. So if that wasn't a higher power saying, guess what little Ricky's gonna be obsessed about when he grows up? <laughs> Home, and all sorts of questions that that brings into place. Um, to continue that narrative, um, we moved, as, as Marilyn was saying, growing up in Miami still is very much like growing up between two imaginary worlds. One that was this 1950s and 60s Cuba, there's these stories in my parents' minds, these were the mangoes were juicier and the salt was sweeter and the, there were real beaches, not that landfill of Miami Beach that we have to go to every weekend. Um, but you know, that whole nostalgic thing and it was, felt like a real place that I was from, but I had never been there. And the other imaginary sort of real world was the Brady Bunch, of course. Um, and this is my fantasy one day is to, to be able to be in that grid. That's the little photo of me. Um, I had to nix Alex, Alice, but what can, I, what can you do? Um, so anyway, I just wanted to read you a little excerpt from the very first chapter, which is called The, the First Real Sangiving, which is how Latinos say Thanksgiving and Sangiving, like San Pedro or San Ignacio. It's a whole other kind of feast day that sort of captures a little bit, just a little bit of the psychological sort of where the book begins and this negotiation between these two worlds. Um, you'll also be introduced to my grandmother um, and, this, and another obsession of mine, which was El Windixi. <laughs> so, which came to epitomize my mythic America, just, just like uh, that forbidden grocery store of the 1970s that, that we, we wouldn't dare to go in. And so my grandmother and me are in cahoots in this, and it's part of our, our, the relationship that continues throughout the book. Every day after Abuela and Abuelo picked me up from school, she chased after specials on name brands and daily staples at one of three Cuban bodegas she frequented. Abuelo would pull his lawn chair from the trunk and camp under a palm tree in the parking lot, smoking a cigar and reading a Spanish translation of a dime store western in the shade while he waited. Some days we went to La Sorpresita, the little surprise, the smallest of the three bodegas, some days we went to El Gallo de Oro, the golden cock, where the Cuban bread was 10 cents cheaper than any place else. And other days to La Caridad, named after the patroness of Cuba, Our Lady of Charity. The neon virgin with flashing halo above the canopy was so lifelike that Abuela would insist I make the sign of the cross before going inside. And every single week I'd beg Abuela to, to go to El Wendixi instead but she refused to set foot in the place. There is none of our food in a wing Dixie. 
Only those Americanos shop there, Abuela sneered. It's too expensive anyway. She complained, dismissing my pleas, until the day she spotted a Winn-Dixie circular in the mail advertising a special too tempting for Abuela to ignore. A whole roasted chicken, its drumsticks crowned with fancy paper hats, and a banner beneath trumpeting its not-so-fancy price. Whole fryers, 29 cents per pound. What does whole fryer mean, Abuela asked me. Pollo entero, I translated. De verdad, <laughs> she said incredulously. At la caridad, I'd pay 34 cents on a special. I played on her peach curiosity. Si, sí, si, sí, abuela, it's a great price for chicken. Increíble, you sure could save a lot of money. <laughs> she agreed and left the circular on the kitchen counter instead of tossing it out, tossing it out with the rest of the junk mail that came in English. Few things intimidated Abuela. Among these were Black Magic, Santeria, and Americanos. <laughs> As for Americanos, Abuela wouldn't go anywhere she perceived to be wholly American, at least not alone. This included the Social Security office downtown, any restaurant with English-only menus, even Kim's Chinese Palace, fancy department stores like Burdine's, <laughs> and definitely not Winn-Dixie. But Abuela also couldn't resist a bargain. The following week, the chicken appeared in the mail at 26 cents per pound, three cents cheaper than the week before, and then 24 cents the week after that. The friars haunted Abuela. <laughs> her stinginess slowly overcame her fear of Americanos until finally she broke. Mijo, will you go with me shopping at a Winn-Dixie mañana? <laughs> she half asked, half commanded. Of course, Abuela, no te preocupes, I'll go with you. Soon I dreamed our pantry would be stocked with crunch berry cereals, <laughs> Oreo cookies, our freezer stuffed with Swanson TV dinners and Eskimo pies, our fridge filled with Hawaiian punch and American cheese. <laughs> the next day after school, Abuela instructed Abuela to drive to El Windizi instead of La Caridad. A gigantic red sign marked its entrance, the letters spelling out Win Dixie the beef people, seeming to even glow even in daylight. What does the beef people mean, Abuela questioned me. I struggled for a translation that would make sense, but none did. La gente de carne, I finally offered. Como? How can that be, Abuela said, perplexed by the thought of people made of meat, which is what my literal translation meant in Spanish. Why not? The chicken people, or the carne puerco people, she amused herself. Abuela tore the advertisement for the fryer from the flyer and stuffed it into her coin purse, which she stuffed into her brazier and kissed Abuelo as if we might not return. <laughs> Dios nos ampare, God be with us, she muttered. She said nothing until we reached the store entrance. Now take me straight to Los Pollos. And no talking to no one. We don't belong here. The electric doors yawned open. I reached for a shopping cart twice as big as the ones at La Caridad, but Abuela tugged me back saying, don't you dare, with her wide open eyes, too afraid to speak. I could barely speak myself, but not from fear, just from pure awe. I was finally in Winn-Dixie. <laughs>